Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I'm just glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Why don't you turn to a few people around you and just tell them, you look good. You look good. Somebody needs to hear that word tonight. All right. Praise God. Well, it's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord starting off this brand new year. I don't know. I feel a, a, a spirit of Urshanites in the house. We got Urshan back in the house. <laughs> Well, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We love our Urshan students, and we're glad that everybody is joining us. Amen. Don't you New Life love when our students come and praise God? We're so glad that you're here tonight. I am looking forward, as Sister Gates said, to our prayer and fasting. The scripture says that whenever Daniel set his heart to seek after the Lord and began the fast, the angel said the very moment that you started, heaven began to operate and began to move, and we were on mission as soon as he began and as soon as he started. And so I know that something's going to happen in the heavenly. Something is going to happen in the spiritual, and I believe that there are going to be strongholds that will be broken over our city, and there will be things God will see set up in anticipation of performing his word and his prophetic fulfillment in this city of St. Louis and in this church and in your life. So I'm looking forward to that. So I hope that you'll join us and uh, come together. Lots of resources online, ways that you can do it. And uh, I know that you'll benefit from that, not only uh, spiritually, but there's a lot of physical and a lot of other uh, ailments and issues that can um, God can use fasting to help us break through some of those things. So hopefully you'll join together with us and we'll have uh, a wonderful time together uh, seeking the face of the Lord at the very beginning of this year, setting the year out right. We want to set the year out right so we can open up ourselves to the voice of the Lord. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And so we're going to humble ourselves together. It's going to be a great time. Hope you have your Bibles ready tonight. We've been going through Learn the Bible in 24 hours. It's taken one or two more hours than that. But uh, at least we're giving it our, our best try. And so we're learning the Bible in 24 hours. Of course, you can't learn everything there is when you begin mining in the Word of God in 24 hours. There's so much. Our hope and desire is that as we have begun this series, as we have walked through uh, each of these nights, is that the hunger for the Word of God grows in your life, that it piques your interest, that there's a desire within you to know more about God and His story and His Word and uh, what He wants for your life and for your family family so that you can draw closer to him. So I pray that this has been good for you. You're going to want to stick around because next week and the following weeks, we're going to have some different teachers far better and wiser than I am. And so uh, if you've enjoyed this teaching, you're going to want to make sure that you show up in these next few weeks and God is going to speak to us and do wonderful things. If you have your Bibles, if you got something to take notes on, hopefully um, open up your Bibles to the book of Job. We're going to begin talking about the poetic books tonight, the five uh, books of the Bible are grouped together as the poetic books, and that's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs, also called the Song of Solomon. We're going to talk about the oldest book in the Bible. The oldest book in the Bible isn't the first book in your Bible. It's not Genesis, but it's actually Job. Job is the um, first book in the Bible. Many scholars believe that Job dates to about 2000 B.C., probably earlier than the time of Abraham. And I don't want to give too much away, but next week you're going to want to stay around because you're going to see how some of these things happen in a timeline and how it connects. It's going to be pretty interesting to you. Uh, a lot of analysts that read the book of Job, study the book of Job, have written on it, regard it as a literary masterpiece. It really is. In fact, Victor Hugo, a French poet of the Romantic period, he is quoted as saying, it is the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. Job is about this mystery of suffering that every one of us as human beings, we go through. And just because you're a believer, a person of faith, been born again of the water and of the Spirit, doesn't mean that you won't endure some suffering. You won't endure some trials. If you call yourself a Christian or someone calls you a Christian, a Christ follower, then all you have to do is look at Jesus and the suffering that he went through so that he might reign in authority and power and understand that if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to follow him through some suffering. So Job talks about this and gives us a little glimpse of why uh, bad things happen to good people. We go to these first two chapters of the book of Job. We see this prologue that happens. It's this conversation uh, where Job, or, or Satan rather, goes before the Lord. Satan means accuser. Somebody say accuser. 
He is an accuser of the brethren. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that we have victory over the accuser of the brethren through our testimony and by the blood of the lamb. He's accuser. He's a talker. He's a smack talker. He, he likes to talk smack about the people of God. And uh, I heard Brother T.F. Tenney one time as he was preaching a message saying uh, one day he was thinking about this accuser and he thought, you know what? There's only one devil. There's only one Satan. Uh, there's only this one fallen angel that the Bible calls the accuser of the brethren. How does he get around to accusing? What's our population now? About 7 billion people. How does he get around to accusing uh, even half that or, or however many millions of believers there are all over the world? And the Lord gave Brother T.F. Tenney, he believes a revelation is that the enemy doesn't have to do his job as much as long as we sit around and accuse one another. We do all of the job uh, that Satan uh, is, is supposed to do. So we've got to watch our mouth and let there be life and let there be love and not judge things before the time. Let's not take over Satan's job there. Uh, the next 24 chapters are a conversation between Job and his friends. You'll understand as you read through the book of Job, these are miserable comforters, these friends of Job's. There's a, a fourth party in this. He's a young man named Elihu. He's filled with fire, and uh, we're going to talk about him. And uh, at the end of the book, of course, God opens up, and he begins to speak, and my, 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 he just wipes uh, the slate clean there as he begins to ask Job 77 different questions. We learn a lot from these, even the very first two chapters of Job. Here's some things that we can learn is that Job, of course, was a very wealthy man. Uh, Satan came to God and he said, no wonder that Job worships you. He has everything that he could ever want. He's a wealthy man. He's got it made in the shade, if you will. But it wasn't his wealth that made him worship God. It was his worship that brought him his wealth. It was his worship that opened up for favor. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can look at people and think, well, it's easy for them to worship God. They've got all the blessings. They've got all the goodness. They've got all of the, the best jobs and the best clothes and the best houses. And, and they've got everything going in their life. Of course, they can serve God. But you don't know their story and what they have done and the sacrifices that they have made. Job made sacrifices every single day, not only for himself, but for his family. He was a committed man. He was a a righteous man. He was a man who had a relationship with God. And because that, uh, it allowed God to bless Job. It allowed God to bring favor into Job's life. Whenever you look at this uh, couple of chapters in Job, you can also see it's clear that Satan can't do anything without getting permission. Isn't that a wonderful news bulletin right there? Satan can't do anything to you without getting God's permission. So if Satan is attacking you, there must be a reason. And if you'll draw closer to God, you will find out the purpose and the pain and the suffering and the battle. And you'll have the power and the love to overcome everything that comes against you. You see that Satan is behind the evil and that's happening to Job. And uh, there's something else that we need to remember, too, as we're looking in Job. I made a note of is that Satan is not on on equal terms with God. This is not God versus Satan. It's God versus nobody. It's God versus nobody. It, this isn't a whole big battle between God and God already licked Satan. He already kicked him out of heaven and then he came down to earth and he kicked him out there and then he came down into even hell itself and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He's already got the keys. He's already got the victory. God already has the victory in every level. So David said, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I ascend into heaven, behold, you are there. God already has the authority. It doesn't matter where your battle is. God has already got the victory. All you've got to do is get on the right side. Let's get on the right side. So don't confuse the attributes of God with the limitations of Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. He can't be at everybody's house at once. <laughs> He was at my house. No, he was at my house. Nah, probably not. Probably just some life. Maybe one of his imps, one of his demons. But Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. He's not omniscient. He does not know all things. Now, he studied humans for a long time. 
So he's put some things together. He knows the word of God. He quoted some things to uh, Adam and Eve, twisted it around a little bit. He quoted some things uh, to Jesus, twisted some things around. Jesus set him straight with the word. That's why you need to know the word. That he cannot do anything to us without God's divine permission. We look at Job's three friends. They're miserable comforters, Job said. He says, you're just miserable comforters. The only thing that they can do is try to figure out what Job did in order for bad things to happen to him. No, no comfort. It's just, Job, you must have done something wrong for all of this stuff to happen. You got a life as. A life as sounds good, except he based his arguments on his own observation and experience. And he argued that Job must be suffering as a result of some sin in his life. But not everybody's experience is exactly the same. Just because it might have happened like that in your life doesn't mean it happened in your neighbor or your friend or another family member's life. You've, you've got to keep things in balance with the Word of God and with what God is doing and each individual's life and there are many things that we don't understand that we don't know job certainly didn't know what was going on a righteous man but he didn't know about the conversation that had gone on in heaven he had a lot of questions he had a lot of pain in his life he didn't understand why all these things were happening to him why god was picking on him but these our early chapters we read it makes it very clear that job was upright you got bildad the second friend of job's he argued from tradition he basically said job you're just a hypocrite you got zophar who rested on orthodox dogma said Job you're just a wicked man and throughout all of this Job keeps responding back and forth and then finally the young man with fire he said I've been quiet long enough I got something to say and so Elihu he gets up and he speaks in front of all of these elders he was more of a brother really if you will he's more of an intercessor than a judge of Job's condition he suggested that Job's condition may actually have a higher purpose it may be moral uh, purpose rather than a punishment it may be aimed at restoring he says rather than the repayment of wrongdoing he sets this stage for God to respond in the world when in the midst of all of this and it's interesting that when God chastises Job's three friends that he doesn't mention Elihu Elihu although he was young had more wisdom than the elders and the scripture tells us how you can have more wisdom than your elders it's Psalm 119 and verse 99 it says I have more understanding than all my teachers because I meditate on your statutes if you want to have wisdom then study the word of God lean not to your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him so God shows up in a whirlwind before Job ask him 77 questions right off the bat Job where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth pow pow Wow, right there where were you whenever the sons of the morning came before where were you when I flung the stars in the sky and named them all where were you 77 questions he just goes after Job one right after the other making sure Job knew what place he really was in he asked these questions about earth and the heavens and living beings and 12 different types of animals he even talks about two uh, dinosaurs the, the behemoth which represents land dinosaurs and the leviathan is a sea type of dinosaur if you haven't read about these in Job 40 and 41 you need to go read about these incredible dinosaurs I would have loved to have seen them from a distance it would have been amazing then in the uh, epilogue of the book God rebukes the three friends of Job they're giving false comfort they're giving untrue impressions of God and God makes that point to life as Bildad and Zophar he said you didn't speak of me the thing that was right and there's a profound lesson that we need to learn here it's when you hear something about God you need to discern where it's coming from and who it's coming from. Because there are false doctrines that sound good, but they're not God. Understand, you've got to understand what thus saith the Lord. Go to his word. God tells him, Job, Job needs to pray for you. And when Job prays for his friends, God restores double everything that Job had. Double for his trouble. How many would like that without the trouble? Just like the double for the trouble. But Job went all through that, and God blessed him at the very end because he was faithful throughout it all. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys at the end of it all. Literally double for his trouble. What's interesting, though, that I found in the Scripture is that he received seven sons and three daughters that was the same number that he lost so why weren't the sons and the daughters doubled it was as if God was giving him a message that said even though your family has died you really haven't lost them 
because you'll be reunited with them in eternity again. There will be a resurrection. It was as if God was comforting him, saying, you really haven't lost your sons and daughters. And those that die in the faith, uh, those that die uh, in the Lord, those that have fallen asleep, those that we lost in 2020, those that we lost this year, you really haven't lost them. There's going to be a reuniting together whenever you put your faith in God. He will take care of you. He will take care of you. It's interesting because when you look at all of the scientific insight, there's at least 15 scientific facts that are suggested in the book of Job written in 2000 BC that weren't discovered until recent centuries. Some of those where the planet is uniquely designed for life. I think this is very important. They call it the uh, anthropic uh, principle. Uh, all the ratios, all the elements, all the laws of the universe are uniquely tuned to support life. That was talked about in the book of Job. You look at the uh, hydrological cycle, the idea that water evaporates and circulates and precipitates. We take that for granted today. How do the clouds stay aloft in the atmosphere? And, and, and how do the uh, water stay in the clouds? Because air and water have weight, but water weighs more than air. How are they supported? All these wonderful things that sometimes we just take for granted, but Job talked about that. It's described in Job all of these things and Job 26 says he stretcheth out the north over the empty space space he hangs the earth on nothing you contrast that with the cosmology of the Greeks or the ancient Egyptians and you realize that science is just catching up with the word of God when people talk about oh well I just base my faith on what I can feel and what I know well you look at people who base it on their human understanding and suddenly they're having to correct it and the word of God has never changed the word of God remains the same the word of God continues to be proven time and time and time again put your faith in the word of God it will never ever fail you so Job is an amazing book to uh, to read and to discover and to study. You look at Psalms. Psalms is Israel's hymnal. The book of Psalms, it's a hymn book of songs, but it's laced with some very strong theology. Our strongest emotions find its truest expression in music. We believe the con with conviction what we sing about. That's why uh, the hymn books and the things that we used to sing back in the day, some of you know those old songs that we used to sing. Oh, I want to see him look upon his place. There is power, power, wonder, working power. In. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise down from his glory, ever living story. Those songs meant something to us because it was reinforcing the theology of the word of God, the doctrine about God. It meant something to us. And yeah, songs change, they do. And uh, there's some new songs I don't like, some new songs I absolutely love. But those songs mean something to us because it speaks to the faith that we had. We had a strong connection and a conviction and emotion that tied us to God through our singing. And so those things were important. Now, it was important, this, this uh, hymnal that Israel used to have. We don't always sing all their psalms. We don't sing all those anymore. Uh, a few of them maybe we rewrite and uh, put a new tune to, but we don't sing all of theirs, and we don't sing all the hymns that we used to sing. There are something called a, a new song, sing a new song unto the Lord. So new songs are wonderful. New songs are great. But I think it's important for us to understand the importance and the value of hymns and psalms and spiritual songs and music as it connects to God. Music is so powerful. Music can be such a, a, a draw to people. The prophets in the Old Testament, sometimes they'd wait for somebody to come and play for them. Somebody that had a spiritual song. Somebody that had an anointing that could come play and usher them into the presence of God. And God would begin to speak through those prophets. That's why music plays such an important part, an integral part in the apostolic faith. The Bible says that even at communion time, when Jesus was doing communion with his people, right as soon as they got done, they began to sing a song there were traditions and songs that they sang together that formulated their faith and brought them closer to God music is powerful that's why Beyonce doesn't have any reason to be in your house right now I call me old fuddy duddy if you want and that I got some old thinking but there is some strong spiritual ties behind music that Satan wants to disguise as good but it's not God 
and it's pulling at you. And if you would start to think through and have a little Selah moment in what you're actually listening to and not just the beat of the drum or the strum of the guitar and you would think about what you're listening to, it is pulling down some strong faith and some strong theology and some strong things about God in our life. It is restructuring the way that we think about life and the way that we think about money and the way that we think about sex and the way that we think about each other. And it starts to reformulate that. And that's why they had psalms that they sang to their children and back and forth and why they sang it unto God. That's why it's important that we don't miss the apostolic powerful worship coming and singing together and lifting up our voices unto God that there's only one God and there's only one name and there's only one truth. It's important. It's important. It's important. And so it's just important uh, what we listen to. The book of Psalms tells us a great deal. It's imp- I love the book of Psalms. I absolutely love it. I read a, a chapter every day with book of Proverbs, but Psalms tells us a great deal about how Israel survived fear and fire and occupation and exile. And because the Psalms also tell us how we have and how we will continue to survive in our own tribulations. Music, it's one of the most effective ways to transmit one's teachings from one generation to another. You remember this when you learned your ABCs. What was one of the first things that they did? They taught you a song. A, B, C, D. Uh Uh-oh, some of you don't know the alphabet. That's, let's teach you a song tonight. (laughs) They taught you a song. It helps you to remember. But more importantly, when doctrine is put into music, the music has a way of planting seeds of doctrine in that fertile soil of our affections. Israel started out making the Psalms, but I like how one writer put it. He said, then the Psalms started to make Israel. The Hebrew term for the Psalms is praise. 55 of those are addressed to the chief musicians. You'll see some subscriptions before the Psalms. They're just as inspired as the very verses themselves. It tells you a lot of things. There's 116 Psalms that have superscriptions uh, above them. It lets us know who wrote the Psalm or where it was sung or what its purpose was. You'll see that word Selah that I mentioned a moment before. It's an untranslated Hebrew term. Selah is uh, connected uh, to the thought, the subject matter, not necessarily the music. It's pause for thought. It's not a pause for the instrument. It's a pause for thought. So while they're singing this Psalm, it says Selah. Take a moment and pause and think about what you're singing right now. The book of Psalms is a beautiful book of poetry. Now uh, Hebrew poetry rather is different than what we think poetry should be. We think poems should rhyme. A parallelism uh, of sound. Roses are red, violets are blue. A face like yours belongs in the zoo. Some of us think that it should rhyme like that or have rhythm. But Hebrew poetry it's got, it's got a different structure. It is, I just wanted to see if you're listening. It's designed conceptually rather than metrically. It's the parallelism of ideas and not just sounds. And if you get into that beautiful rhythm of the way that they wrote poetry, there is a wonderful uh, ideology, theology to it in the book of Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. 73 of them are attributed to David, 12 to Asaph, 12 to the sons of Korah, 1 to Moses, which is one of my favorite Psalms in all of the book. And there's 50 that are uh, uh, anonymous. Uh, Psalms has been divided. You can divide it into a lot of different ways. I like how uh, one scholar, a few scholars have divided up Psalms uh, into five different books that paralleled the five books of Moses. I think this was interesting. Uh, Chapters 1 through 41, uh, it deals with man, which some have called the Genesis package. Uh, uh, Psalms 42 through 72 are about deliverance. They connect that to Exodus, that book of deliverance coming out and being delivered from Egypt. Uh, Psalm 73 through 89, the sanctuary is the prominent theme, the Leviticus books. It talks about the sanctuary. It talks about the temple. Uh, Psalm 91 uh, through 106 are about unrest and wondering. The book of Numbers, the last, uh, the fifth focus is in the word of the Lord, the Deuteronomy section. I love how it breaks up. There's different ways that you can break it up, but it's so powerful to connect them because as we learned at the very beginning of all of our lessons, there is a central theme that God is revealing throughout the word. They're all connected. You have something called the songs of degrees or the songs of ascent as they were ascending up to Jerusalem or as they were sending up the temple mountain as they were sending up into the temple they would sing these beautiful hymns and songs that even Jesus and the disciples would have sung these songs of ascent some believe that uh, uh, they were named because the temple had 15 st- steps so there were 15 songs of ascent but there could be another reason I think it's interesting to even think about is that Hezekiah uh, Hezekiah at one time was one of the godliest kings uh, of Judah he wrote a lot of psalms and proverbs he restored temple worship he reorganized a lot of the documents 
lamentation in 2 Kings chapter 20. You may remember the story. He was about to die and he prayed. He said, God, give me 15 more years, please. And God said, well, why don't you get up and go out and look at Ahaz's sundial. And whenever he looked at the sundial, got up and looked at that sundial, God moved the shadow back 15 degrees. And he added 15 years to Hezekiah's life. That's a pretty powerful answer to prayer, to get 15 more years. And so perhaps uh, the, those 15 songs of degrees or ascent may be about those events. I think that's interesting uh, to think about. The Messianic Psalms. Psalms is quoted more than any other book in the Old Testament. The Psalms were apologetic, prophetic in nature. You look at all the different Psalms that talk about the Messiah, prophecies that pointed to the Messiah. Psalm 2, 8, 16, 22, 23. It's very specific wording that only applied to Jesus. And you look at the parallels of the prophecy and the fulfillment of it in Jesus. There is no denying that, that the book is true and that God had a plan all along. The fact that he would be impaled, that Jesus would be impaled on a cross, that he'd be thirsty and given wine mixed with gall, that lots would be cast by his enemies for his garments, and yet in all of that, not a bone would be broken. All of that's detailed in the book of Psalms. The fact that he would rise from the dead and ascend into heaven, that he's our high priest, that he would judge all the nations, that he would be the son of David, that people would sing Hosanna to him, that he would be blessed forever. All of that is laid out in the Psalms. Uh, I love Psalms 22 through 24, some of my favorite Psalms uh, right there. They're called the Shepherd Psalms. Psalm 22. Uh, probably some of you will remember when Brother Daniel Seagraves uh, preached and he taught here a few years back and uh, he suggested as we look through the scripture that is, it is possible that Jesus quoted even Psalm 22 uh, the entirety of that psalm on the cross. Uh, it's mentioned a few of the phrases that Jesus said there on the cross that are directly from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Comes directly from Psalm 22. Uh, possibly quoted in entirety by Jesus on the cross. While he was on that cross think about this, the form of capital punishment whenever Psalm 22 was written was not crucifixion, it was stoning. Crucifixion didn't happen until way later, and yet there's a prophecy about the Messiah that would be hanging on a cross, talking about that 700 years before Jesus was ever crucified, talking about the suffering Savior. Then you've got the beautiful, most beautiful psalm uh, ever penned, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then you get to Psalm 24, the exalted sovereign, uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he founded upon the seas, established it upon the flood some of these beautiful psalms. If we go back just for a moment to Psalm chapter 23, I think it's beautiful because you see seven compound titles of God. You've got the Tetragrammaton, which is four letters. It's Y-H-W-H. You really don't need to know a whole lot about this, but Hebrew doesn't really have any vowels, and it's got these consonants that they throw together, and so it's Y-W-H uh, or W-H, also uh, J-H-V-H, which in English translation is Jehovah, and it's Yahweh, it's the name of God, and whenever you look at Psalm 23, it's got seven compound titles, so it says Yahweh Jireh, what Abraham talked about on Mount Moriah whenever he offered up his son Isaac, God is my provider, Jehovah Rapha, you are the God that heals, Jehovah Shalom, he is God, our peace, Jehovah Tiskanu, God, our righteousness, you lead me beside the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Jehovah Nissi, God ever present. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Jehovah Ra, God, our shepherd. It just over and over again, it confirms what God is to us. How many is thankful that he is everything that you have need of. If you need a healer, if you need peace, if you need a covering, whatever you need, he is it for you. He can be that. We get to this wonderful book of Proverbs and what I like to do through Proverbs. Hopefully you've picked out a Bible reading plan this year. Uh, I'm going through a new one I've not tried before and I'd encourage some of you if you've not picked one out or maybe you've read through different Bible plans, maybe look up this one, Professor Grant Horner. Professor Grant Horner has uh, 10 chapters a day. I know it sounds like a lot and it may be for some, but if you've read the Bible uh, through or read the Bible often, it's actually a pretty breeze. You can get through those 10 chapters in about 20 minutes. He's got a free app that you can download, check off uh, your chapter. Uh, and it's really enlightening because it'll bring you from the Old Testament into the New Testament back and forth. And you'll begin to see the themes. You'll begin to see God working 
uh, along these beautiful interwoven lines of prophecy and stories and promises and fulfillment throughout the Word of God. I find it interesting. Whatever you do, hopefully you will find time every day to read the Word of God and to pray, give us this day our daily bread. I hope that you've got a Bible that you, you enjoy reading. Find a Bible uh, that you enjoy reading. Find the ESV, KJV, NKJV, uh, NASB, anything but the message. Find something that you can read and that you enjoy and just get into the Word of God. So we come to Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is filled with such wisdom. I read it every day because, well, I want to be wise. And I'm not quite there yet, but I'm on my way. And uh, the more I read, the more I realize, the less I know. The book of Proverbs can really be summarized as prudence through precept. These instructional Proverbs are intended to be memorized just a few at a time. Proverbs means a very terse maxim or a, a brief, pithy statement. So you're not going to find a narrative, a long story in Proverbs. Uh, and some of the verses may not even seem like they connect uh, because some of them don't. Uh, they're just these wonderful truths and statements of wisdom that if you you will follow them and apply them to your life it'll make you wealthy it'll teach you how to find friends to be a good friend it'll teach you how to honor the Lord and to put him first in every area of your life it'll teach you how to honor your spouse it'll teach you how to find a spouse it'll teach you how to stay away from those who try to divide spouses it'll teach you all these wonderful things get into the word of God Proverbs has a lot to teach you right there uh, proverb doesn't argue, it assumes. It's not an apologetic device. It is a practical instructional device. Solomon wrote 3,000 of these. Lots of them are written in Proverbs. Some of these are arranged during that reign of Hezekiah when he was uh, getting the documentation and things together. The climax of Proverbs, of course, is Proverbs chapter 31 about the virtuous woman, the acrostic about the virtuous woman. It's a beautiful passage. And, of course, all of us men want to find that Proverbs. I found, hopefully the rest of you can find your Proverbs 31 woman. But of course, I heard somebody say that if you want that Proverbs 31 woman, you got to be that Proverbs 1 through 30 kind of man. I don't know who said that. Maybe it was. I think that's powerful. <clears throat> I, well, I found my Proverbs 31 woman, so I don't know what I'm said that says about me. Maybe the Lord just lucked me into it, but I, I, here I am. But I found favor come to this beautiful book of Ecclesiastes. I, I know it sounds like a lot of pessimism, but it really isn't. All is vanity. Whenever you go to Ecclesiastes, the Hebrew word koaleth means the preacher, and it appears to be Solomon's sermon on the natural man's quest for good life. Solomon had inconceivable wealth and power. He was able to satisfy his every longing and every wish but he ended up pretty cynical about it all. The conclusion in Ecclesiastes that Solomon comes to, the preacher comes to, is all is vanity. It's bravely honest rather than pessimistic. It just sees life beyond all of life ir ironies and wearying re repetition to divine control and future restitutions. And finally, he gets to the conclusion of the whole matter in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and 13. And this is the most important part of the entire book of Ecclesiastes and of your life. This is the most important part. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, the whole matter of life. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's the most important conclusion to all of it. He deals with 10 vanities. I'm not going to uh, take the time to go through each and every one of these. The vanity of human wisdom, both the wise and the foolish die, he says. Human labor, the worker, is no better than the shirker in the end, the one who doesn't work. Human purpose, uh, man purposes, but God disposes. It's all of these vanities that he lists. And uh, I'll let you write that down, screenshot that, or not worry about it. Here comes number six, human fame. It's brief, it's uncertain, soon forgotten. Uh, all of these wonderful things, human coveting gain cannot be enjoyed despite desire. He just lists all of these ten vanities and talks about each of them in detail. He's an exhausted man at the end of his life, and he says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good and whether it be evil. Paul reiterated this in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5. He said, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from 
God. It's not up to us right now to point to the world and start judging and separating all of the wheat from the tares. That's not our job right now. Our job is to love and to bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ. Let him convict them of their sin. Let your good work shine before them so that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. But don't take the time right now and weary yourself out by trying to play Judge Judy in every person's life and situation right now. Let there be only one judge, the Father of us all, who's above all through us all and in us all and why don't you put your life in the master's hands and leave all the judging up to God and why don't you just continue to love above all love faith hope and love but the greatest of all of these is the book or is love rather in the book of Romans chapter 8 Solomon's conclusion it leads us to Romans chapter 8 for the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What that first Adam got us into, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, can get us out of and bring us into glorious liberty. That's what the new birth does for you. When you are born into this kingdom, you are delivered from a life of vanity and death, and you are delivered with purpose, and you are delivered with life, and you are brought into a new promise, and you are brought into a new hope a lively hope and God gives you gifts and he gives you his spirit and he gives you a hope for a better tomorrow while you are living for him today all of these wonderful things can come you don't have to be like that man Solomon who spent his wealth and his life and all the things of this world and at the end he was empty at the end he had nothing else to show for it in his own personal life but if you put your hand in the hand of the master he will guide your life and shape it in such a I'm a living testimony and they're all around this place here tonight that if you will just trust the master and trust God, God will provide some glorious liberty for your life and bring out about in you something beautiful and something wonderful that you could not see before. I'm coming to a close right now if they want to come to the keyboard and give them some hope. Song of songs, Song of Solomon. Oh, the theme of this book, ultimate, ultimate love. Some think it's an allegory. Some think it's literal. Some think it just a handbook for sensual lovemaking. In fact, the rabbis wouldn't let anybody study this unless you were over the age of 30. What's that tell you about the book? I love to read it as a teenager. I just love the word. So how do we look at it? <laughs> Some of you hypocrites won't tell me that you do, but I... Just want to be honest. <laughs> Told like an opera. Solomon is the hero of the... Thank you for that spiritual music. Right, We needed some of that right now. Solomon's the hero of this piece, right? You got Shulamite. She's Cinderella, if you will. The word Shulamite, simply this feminine rendering of the book of Solomon. So the characters are really Mr. and Mrs. Solomon. The story takes place in the mountain district of Ephraim. King Solomon has this vineyard. He lets it out to an Ephraimite family as keepers and the husband the father had apparently passed away but there was a mother and at least two sons and daughters the older daughter the Shulamite is forced by her brothers to do hard work hard labor she's denied the privileges that a growing young lady would find in a Jewish community my mother's sons were angry with me she says sounds like they were probably maybe half brothers mine own vineyard I have not kept she had no opportunity to look in a mirror and straighten herself up and take care of her own self. My own vineyard I have not kept. One day she discovers this handsome stranger. He's a shepherd who viewed her as without blemish. I mean, come on. I know it's a love story, but can't you see Jesus in all of this? Oh. Mm. This friendship between the Shulamite and the shepherd it ripens to affection and finally a blossoming love. He promised to return and make her his bride. I mean, come on. <laughs> After his extended absence, brothers were skeptical, thought she had been deceived by this stranger. She dreamed of him at night. She trusted him. And one day, there was a glorious processional that arrived. The attendants all announced, the king, the king has sent for you. And so in obedience, she responds and she comes before the king. And guess who it is? It's the shepherd. 
What a beautiful story of love. Church, he is coming again for you. The shepherd, this king of kings, he is coming for you. I know we went through some stuff in 2020. I know we don't really want to talk about that right now. We went through some stuff, but it's a new day, and this new day may bring new challenges. It may bring new trouble. There may be people that would scoff at us and say, where's the sign of his coming? Because everything seems like it was since it was the beginning. Seems like everything is just keeps on going on. Where is he at? Surely he has deceived you, but you got to keep holding on to the faith because one day he's going to split the skies. The angels are going to come, and they're going to sound that trumpet, and King Jesus Jesus is going to come for his bride. The lover of our soul is going to come. He's going to wrap his arms around us. He's going to invite you into the banquet table. I'm telling you, church, one day, soon and very soon, we shall see the king. That's why you got to hold on to the word. That's why you got to hold on to the truth. That's why you got to hold on to his love. Don't let anything separate you right now. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything keep you back from this truth and faith that we have because one day he's coming for you. I know you don't think you look like like much right now I know that you maybe think like you're like the Shulamite woman say I haven't been able to make myself really look a whole lot great right now I feel still a little bit shabby and a little bit undone but whenever you read his word he says I call you a people which were not a people I call you a chosen people I call you a holy people a royal priesthood a holy nation you are my sons you are my daughters he calls you his bride church that's what God thinks about you old things are passed away and all things are become new. He takes away those garments of mourning and he gives you garments of joy and gladness and peace. He puts on you robes of righteousness. He says, slay the fatted calf. Put the ring on their finger because my son, my daughter has returned back home to me again. That's what he thinks about you and one day when you see him face to face, you're not going to worry about all the suffering. You're not going to worry about all the trials of this life and the people that stalk and the people that made fun of you because when you see him face to face, everything is going to be reckoned. Everything is going to be made true. Everything is going to be unveiled in the light of his glory and you will know that your redeemer lives and when you stand on that day you too shall be like him. Oh, if you love him, would you just stand right now and lift up your hands and lift your voice if you're watching online or you're in this place right now. Church, would you just lift up your voice and tell him how much you love him? Would you right now declare your faith to him and say, God, I trust you. I believe in you. I know you're coming again one day. I believe your word. Everything that you've said to me, for God cannot lie. I thank you that you're not slow concerning your promises. Some men count slowness, Lord, but you're patient with us. You're not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. I thank you that you're coming again soon. I thank you that you're coming for a people who have made themselves ready, who continue to believe in your unfailing love and the power of your word. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I worship you tonight. Oh, I give you glory. I give you honor, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, <laughs> oh God, you see your people tonight. Your wonderful church. Lord, they've come through some stuff. Oh, <laughs> oh God. They've come through some painful experiences. They come through some heartaches, oh Lord. They come through people leaving them and family forsaking them. They have come through some trials and some testing. But Lord, look on them right now. They're holding on to the faith. They're holding on to this truth. They're holding on to your promises. Oh God, I thank you that you're coming again. I pray that your hope and peace would arise in them right now. I pray, oh Lord, that you would help them to live as overcomers. I pray that they would not listen to the accuser of the brethren, but I pray that you put on them the helmet of salvation. I pray that you would anoint their mind, oh Lord, and let them be transformed and not conformed to this world. But I pray that they would shine as lights for you. I pray that they would be strengthened in the power of your might. I pray they would be steadfast and movable, always abounding in your work, Lord. I pray that each one would find their calling and their gifting in the kingdom of God, finding their purpose in the body of Christ, that one day they could stand before you, Lord, showing you what they have done with what you have given to them as good stewards of this grace. Lord, I thank you. 
I thank you for your people, Lord. I thank you for your faithfulness to us when we were faithless. Oh, I thank you, Lord. Times when we stumbled and we fell, I thank you, Lord, that your grace was there. Where sin did abound, your grace does much more abound. I thank you. I thank you that you're a keeper. I thank you, Lord, that you're my healer. I thank you that you're my righteousness, Lord. The psalmist was right. You are my shepherd, I shall not want. I thank you, O oh Lord, tonight that you have gathered us together from kindreds and places and people, O oh Lord. I thank you that you have brought us together, that your banner over us is love. I thank you that you brought us to your banqueting table even in the presence of our enemies God. You have prepared a table before us. I thank you for it. I thank you for it, Lord. I don't know the resolutions that your people have made. I, I don't know what goals they have planned for this year. I, I don't know what they have purposed in their heart, but I pray they would commit it to you and trust in you with all of their heart and not lean to their own understanding. I pray that you would guide our feet. Lord, we're getting ready to enter into a time of fasting and praying, oh Lord, at the beginning of this year, seeking your will, wanting your purpose to come to pass in our life, not only in our own families, but in this city. And oh God, I pray that you would bring the church together in unity give us boldness oh God you see this wicked world that we're living in right now people that have scoffed and they have made a mockery oh Lord of this truth they made a mockery of what we have believed but Lord your coming is, is so soon and I pray that you would bring your people together as one help us to keep holding on to the faith not giving up not giving in oh Lord help us to be godly examples and godly uh, lights in this world I pray Lord that you would bring the church together as a a mighty army, Lord. A mighty army bring us together so that this city can truly see the light. Oh, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. I thank you in advance for what you're doing among your people right now. I thank you for healing that's in this place right now. I thank you for peace that's in this place right now. I thank you for deliverance that is in this place right now. I thank you for your truth that sets men free in the name of Jesus. I thank you, O oh Lord, that weights and chains are being broken right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, O oh Lord, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through you to the pulling down of every stronghold. Breathe that in right now in the name of Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost and fire. Let it fall fresh on you right now in this Bible study. Come on, let there be a refreshing right now in the name of Jesus. If you got to repent, repent. Turn away from your sin and turn to the living God. But let there be a refreshing come upon you right now. This is the rest wherein you cause the weary to rest. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We seek after you, God. Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's coming again, saints. I said he's coming again. If you believe it, just one more time, last time, lift up your hands together and just thank you. Say, Lord, I thank you that you're coming again. Help us to keep our eyes upon you, ready and waiting, watching and praying, Lord, until you return again. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place tonight. You can go in faith knowing that your Redeemer lives and that He's coming again for you one sweet day. Keep holding on to the Word of God. And while we're on our way there, love one another. Love one another. So before you leave this place, before you get offline, why don't you encourage somebody? Let them know he's coming again soon. We hope to see you again on this Sunday. We're going to begin kicking off our our theme for this year. God is going to speak to us in a wonderful way. I love you. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. You're dismissed in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Love one another before you leave. These are the people of God you're going to heaven with. God bless you.